All right, let's do some landscape painting. We're gonna use watercolors and I'm going to paint this simple landscape. There's foreground elements, a little lake, and a simple mountain ridge in the background. So let's get to it. Step number one, use willow charcoal to make a sketch on your page. Willow charcoal has a dark line but it erases really easily because it's so soft and so it's a great choice for making sketches. First thing you want to establish in the sketch is your horizon line. So it's not quite in the middle of the page, which is excellent. You don't ever want to have a horizon line in the middle of the page. It's about up here. And voila. Next, place your largest elements in terms of that horizon line. So obviously I have this mountain pass. Place it. it kind of loops in and up. Okay, then I need this mountain lake placed a little bit better. There you go, mountain lake. And juxtaposed against that lake are these really pretty flowers, but I don't want to draw too many of them because that charcoal is going to be ugly when it gets mixed with the paint. Then this is just grasses. Grass, 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 grass. I don't want to overdraw. Step two in the sketching phase is to clean up your lines, like the horizon line that goes through the trees. And this needs to be broken up more, of course. Maybe I want to indicate a few of the shapes of the trees on these mountains. And then, step three in the sketching phase is the final step, and that is to protect your whites with miskit. Miskit is masking fluid. And what I'm going to mask is not whites exactly, but it's the edges of these flowers in the foreground because they're bright pink and they're hidden in these green grasses or up against the blue water and these really dark trees here. So in order to make sure that they are going to stay nice and vibrant in the picture, I'm going to protect them with my masking fluid just like this. So you just take some time, protect those flowers, then give it time to dry. Depending on how thick the puddles are, they'll be completely dry in 5 to 15 minutes. So let's come back to it when we're ready to paint. Now my frisket film is dry and I'm going to erase these really dark lines, put them in with a lighter pencil. I want them to stay visible but not that visible, especially here at the mountain's edge. So I'm just making an interesting kind of jaggedy edge, going over my old lines. Good. So now the first stage of the painting is done. The sketch is complete. Now we need to start painting. You always paint back to front. The farthest element in the background is the sky. So step one of the painting process is to paint the sky. And painting the sky is really fast. I'm going to use a two inch flat brush, get it wet with clean water, wet down my page. I paint skies wet into wet generally because that gives me a nice flow. Then use a watered masking technique to carefully paint around that mountain edge. Water masking is basically painting in water where you want the paint to go. So it gives you a really nice way to easily keep control over the medium without having to use frisket film or masking fluid on everything. And then I can still use a wet on wet technique as opposed to a dry brush technique and get nice flow up here without making the color run all over the page. So once the sky area is completely covered, you might even be able to see it shining here. And I'm going to get some cerulean blue and maybe a little bit of cobalt blue. And if you want, you can always test those colors before you put them down. In fact, it's a really good idea too. So for that purpose, I have a big box of scraps of watercolor paper that I've punched a one inch hole out of. So I just paint the color that I've mixed up and I put it next to my reference material if that's what I'm trying to match or I put it next to the painting if I want to see how the color is going to look there. Don't forget 
that you are going to lose about two values when you watercolor paint as it dries. See how it makes these nice natural cloudy formations because the paper is so wet? So you use wet on wet technique when you want a lost edge. That's something like this where the edge is fuzzy. And you use a dry brush technique when you want a clear crisp edge. And because I've used my water masking technique, I can paint all the way up to the edge here and it's not going to go down into the mountain. I'm letting the photograph suggest things to me, but I'm not following them exactly. Okay, so that's good for the sky. I'm not going to go back into it. If you touch back into it, you're gonna create bleeds. But the water that's reflecting doesn't touch the sky, and so I can paint that without interrupting the flow of the sky. So I'm going to jump down to the water now. It's a really similar color. I'm going to rinse out my brush and do the water masking technique again. And then this looks like it's more of an Antwerp blue. So I'm going to pull out some Antwerp, mix it with some cobalt and a little ultramarine, test it. Now here at the water's edge, there's some green things reflecting. So I'm going to drop in those intense greens then I'm going to go in with a blue and I'm going to keep the edge broken by bouncing it in like this to start suggesting that there are some plants here that are covering the edge of the lake. You never rely on just one simple color. It's far more interesting to have two or three colors mix on the page. Always paint in the largest brush you can for the area and then I'll show you a little trick. Down here, it's looking a little false, not like grasses, so I'm gonna spray it with some water. This is a spritzer bottle. I got it for one dollar. It's actually a, to fill with travel size hairspray or something like that. So you can find them at grocery stores in the trial size section. And then I'm going to let this move on its own and encourage it a little bit with not the brush itself, but the handle of the brush and I'm making this nice and loose down here. It's going to be easier to break in with foliage when the pattern is loose and looks more random as opposed to the tight look that I was getting with just the brush bristles themselves. Now it's a little bit more dry. I'm gonna go back into these reflected areas, make that color a little bit more intense and add some more color that can pool down in this area here. Here's some cerulean that I'm gonna let mix in there too. Then I'm going to rinse out my brush and squeegee off the excess with my fingertips. And then I'm going to take out just a little bit of this up here because I like the way the light goes from light in the background to more intense in the foreground and I'm losing that. So this is how you can just remove a little bit of paint without damaging the surface, without rubbing it, without introducing things that are going to make the bleed uneven, the drying uneven, like paper towels or cloths or something like that. That is the end of step one in the painting process. So now let's let it dry completely and we'll move forward. Now the sky and the water are both completely dry. So step two in the painting process is to paint the mountains. And the reason for that is because the trees are going to go over the top of the mountain. So you always want to paint back to front, the elements that are behind first, and then you can layer the ones that are on top afterwards. Then I'm not going to wet the mountains before I paint. I'm going to use the color on a flat brush, use the edge of the brush, and go slowly and carefully on the edge. And then you can go a little bit faster when you're painting the larger portions. And just like before, make sure that you drop in some different colors. So not everything is a solid gray. I'm also going to drop in some purples and some blues. You can see how I get some more water on the brush and I wash that color down before it has a chance to dry into some unnatural shapes. Then, 
because the grass doesn't touch the mountains, I can paint that. So let's go down and paint some of that grass in next. I'm still using my one inch flat. Then I'm going to start dropping it in, slicing it in these blade shapes just like this. So I'll sort of define the boundaries over here. This is about how far up the grass grows. And then it goes all the way over here on this side. Now I can also keep that a little bit looser by spritzing my paper. Because I'm not going to see a lot of individual grass blades. I just want the feel of grass. So having it spritzed will sort of bleed out the lines and make them less uniform, more realistic. But painting them initially with the blade pattern will keep them looking like something very different from the background in the water so they still have a grassy look. When you've filled your page, rinse off your brush, squeegee it off, and then you'll notice that in a few places in the foreground there are some grass blades that come forward, they're lighter than the surroundings, and they have a very definite shape. While the paper is still semi-wet, I can use a damp brush and slice out those details without creating bleeds. So I'm just going to take a little bit of time and lift out some of the foreground blades just like I'm doing here. I think that's enough. The last thing that we have to do is drop in these dark, dark trees. And this is actually dry enough to let me do that right now. So I'm going to mix up a dark and then I'll use the side of the brush again and start to drop in that shape. I see more dark toward the middle of the pine tree, so I'm going to emphasize some Payne's Gray mixture there. Then you can be a little bit faster as you get down to the middle part. And use a tapping brush stroke like this to give that broken look in the branches. Then I'm going to take my time around the base and carve out a few of those grass shapes. I'm just going to spritz that tree to make sure that all the tone blends well. And then I'm going to let this dry completely. Alright, here's the painting so far. There's the top and there's the bottom. So now I'm going to add some more details. Details to the mountains and details to the foreground. And when I'm certain that all of this middle ground shape is good, I'm going to take off the masking fluid and add those bright bursts of pink. Now for those trees, I'm going to use the corner of the one inch brush and start to put in these pine tree shapes. You're painting clumps of trees because this is in the background. So you want to give the suggestion of the detail without going overboard and making it unrealistically detailed. And notice how I'm keeping some open spaces too. There are some open spaces so that you get the idea that there are gaps between the trees where you can see the hillside. And don't forget your friend the brush handle. You can always scratch in some smaller details by just touching that wet paint with the brush handle and developing a few hard edges. Okay, that's pretty good for the trees. So now I'm going to rinse out my brush again. And I want to work on the shadows that I see in the mountains. So I'm just using a more intense version of the same mountain color, still on my palette. And I'm just adding the shadow shape carefully with the side of the brush. So study nature, try to determine what's causing the shapes, and that will help you to put them down accurately in your paintings. Here I see a little bit of yellow. And then I'll add that yellow some other places in the mountains too, otherwise it's going to look accidental. With the shadows on the mountain dry, I can move into the foreground where I accent individual blades of grass. Get your masking fluid. With my fine tip here, I can draw the grass that I want to keep, so those highlighted blades for instance, and I'm just painting over them let that dry, then I can paint over those protected grass blades with a much darker color 
let that dry again, remove it, and you'll have some high detail grass blades and some that aren't. So let me take a little bit of time and put some masking fluid on some grass blades. I'll let it dry and then I'll come back and show you how to place the dark color over the top. Now I have some lighter green grass blades protected with masking fluid. So let me show you how I'm going to proceed here. I'm not just going to paint over everything because then I'll lose all the grass that I didn't protect with masking fluid. A better way is to protect the surface with some scratch paper like this. And I'll also put some paper under to keep my painting surface clean because we are going to spatter in some grass and it's going to get everywhere. Round brushes work the best. So just get your round brush wet and then I'm just going to whip it. See how I whip it? I'm not tapping, I'm whipping the brush by the handle. Whip, 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 whip. So I'm going to fill in this bottom area with whips of color, focusing on some darks. So then after I've whipped for a while, I'll let this dry and then I'll rub off the masking fluid. Now my greens are in place and they're dry, so I'm going to remove the masking fluid. The easiest way to do that is with a rubber cement eraser. Just feel with your fingertips to see if you've missed a spot as you make your way across the page. So I'm really liking the way that that looks. And now I'm going to go in and add those pops of color. I'm going to develop the intense pinks with alizarin crimson and just start at the base and kind of fluff out those little lines. And if you want there to be a variation between the dark areas and the light, then after you've put on your color, you can dab the tips with a Kleenex. Dab, dab. Then go back in and add a little bit of a darker color to the base, just like that. Now do that for all of the flowers. Then after you're done with the pink on these flowers, you need to paint the stems. So get some green on your brush. For those really small flower stems, you might need a smaller brush. So I'm going to use a rigger. I just pull down, pull down, pull down, pull down. Okay, so let me add some flower petals and some stems and I will come back to you. Okay, here is the painting after those flowers are put in place. So here's the top and the bottom. And that is the completed landscape. So notice I am not going to fuss over any more details than that. I want to keep it simple and fresh. The colors are nice and clear. Nothing looks muddy. It's a good composition, so that's a good place to stop. For those of you who are following along, if you had trouble with anything, it might have been because you went back in and you picked at things and you weren't satisfied to just let the painting be. Notice that there are a lot of weird looking grass shapes and things that I could fuss over if I wanted to, but stand back from the piece and you decide, does it give the impression of the landscape that I'm going after if I don't change anything? Always err on the side of leaving it alone because it's a lot easier to overwork your painting than to underwork it, to not give enough detail. The eye is going to fill in most of that detail for you. So what you're going after, especially in a loose watercolor like this, is or the impression of the landscape. So that concludes our watercolor tutorial. I'm going to go ahead and give you some time to work on it yourself now. Remember, paint from the back to the front and let your colors dry in between layers. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting the medium and you're going to get frustrated with the water just getting out of control and smearing all over the place. Okay, so best of luck to you in your studio and I will see you next month for another drawing and painting tutorial.